Before I started in tourism, I didn't really know much about our history. I didn't really think much about anything at all. For me, it was something a long time ago. Everything was done by hand and there was no technology and it was a tough life. Then you died. Over the last 10 years, I've come to have a whole lot more respect for what they did back then. We look back at Perth today and we see a modern city with roads and houses and parks to go kick and hit a ball around. Well, nothing was like that here when the settlers first arrived. These settlers were sick of their life in England and trying to find a better outcome for their families by sailing halfway around the world to a place they'd never heard of, only on a dream. When they got here, they saw the great Australian bush. Now I think you have to be a little bit crazy to come out here first knowing that there is nothing here but then looking around and being able to come up with a plan. Houses here, town over there, something over there and something else over the back there. The first people arrived in Fremantle in 1829. The first government building built in 1831. Roads, houses and suburbs not far behind. The WA history may not be long, but it has changed pretty fast. We covered some of that in our Fremantle and Perth videos. So this time it's C.Y. O'Connor. He was a civil engineer that had a big influence in the early days of WA. We looked briefly at one of his projects in Fremantle. And this time we're gonna look at what most people thought was a pipe dream. He was an Irishman who arrived here in 1891 from Auckland at the request of John Forrest, a Premier of Western Australia. While building the Fremantle Harbour, he was asked to come up with a way to get water to the goldfields of Western Australia. Gold was discovered around the Southern Cross region in 1888, then later in the Coolgardie area, and a large number of hopeful miners arrived to find their fortune. What there wasn't was water. What water there was cost more than the gold that they were getting out of the ground. When O'Connor came up with the plan, he had to overcome a number of hurdles. Nothing like this had ever been done before over such a great distance. There were major issues that had to be overcome. Where were they going to get the materials from to build the pipeline? Where were they going to get the water from? And how were they going to pay for it? Unfortunately, a number of others didn't the pipeline was going to cost two and a half times the state budget. The critics of the time were concerned about putting so much money into one project that sounded like an impossible task. In today's money, if I've worked this out right, it's something like $14,878,629,646. A number of sites were looked at for a possible dam. One was found to be the best option. They decided to dam the Helena River and construction started in the second half of 1898. Once they started groundworks on the granite base, it was soon discovered that there was an earthquake fault line in the rock, so they had to excavate and blast even lower, which added to the cost and gave the critics more to complain about. Originally the wall height was 30.5 metres, but this was later raised another 10 metres in the early 1950s, which trebled its capacity to around 63.6 .6 million kilolitres. That's a lot of water when it's full. While the dam's construction was underway, work started on the pump stations to get the water up over a thousand feet and on its way for 560 kilometres to the gold fields. To keep the water moving, there would need to be eight steam-powered pump stations built every 60 kilometres apart. We're going to follow this pipeline as it makes its way through the West Australian wheat belt area into the gold fields. And the best place to start is always at the beginning, at the number one pump station at the bottom of the weir.
There were three steam boilers that ran three pumps. The pumps were a twin action pump that could use the same steam three times, so they were quite efficient. There is lots of information to look at and a pumping example to keep the kids occupied. Of all ages. Now that the water's left the pump station, it's on its long run to Kalgoorlie. Once the water got to the top of the hill, they had another pump station there to help push it along its way. That wasn't needed anymore, so in the 1960s they demolished it. So we're heading off to the next station, number three. The pump station is no longer used. But after many years of hard work by a lot of volunteers, they have transformed the station into what is called one of the best rural museums in the state, if not the country. So let's go in and have a look. The raised wooden platform was used to bring in the loaded rail wagons of wood for the boilers. The 8 tonne Worthington pump could pump more than 20 million litres of water a day. This one was relocated from the number 7 pump station. Stations 1 to 4 required two pump units to be in operation to maintain the water pressure. Stations 5 to 8 only needed to have one pump in operation due to the low rise in height between these stations. Some pump stations are still in use, just with modern pumps like this one here in Meriden. All of the pump stations ran on steam and they needed a steady supply of firewood to keep them going. For the most part, the pipeline was built along the Eastern Goldfields railway line. This provided a steady supply of material to help keep the pumps running. Every pump station had a small community living with it. It took a team to keep the pumps running 24 hours. These days people have moved on, but some remnants of their life are still here to see today.
would have to be collected either from the local area or offloaded from the nearby train line. Boilers had to be kept fired up and water had to keep running into the boilers. When the pipeline was constructed, it was the longest freshwater pipe in the world and it still has the record today. Most steel pipes at the time were riveted. A fellow named Ferguson designed a revolutionary locking bar system which improved water flow as it removed the need for rivet holes and rivets poking into the pipe, which would have the effect of slowing the water down. The pipe was then coated with tar and bitumen to help protect the steel from corrosion. This coating was then sprinkled with sand to prevent the tar melting in the summer sun. The steel plates were imported flat from Germany and the United States of America, and the locking bar and joining rings came from England. The pipes were joined through a process called chalking, which formed a waterproof seal. A ring of steel was fitted around the ends of the pipes, which left a 6mm clearance. The gap was then filled with rope and molten lead, which was poured onto the joint and hammered into place until it cooled. In 1901, a chalking machine was invented which sped up the process. The last pump station was located a little before Coolgardie. From here, it's about 70 kilometres to Kalgoorlie. After about 5 to 11 days, the water comes out here at Mount Charlotte Reservoir. On average, 90 million litres of water is pumped daily through the pipe. The pipe itself holds around 300 million litres of water. And if the pipe had to be shut down for maintenance, then the water in here could keep Kalgoorlie going for another two to three days. O'Connor never saw the water come out here. He committed suicide about six months before the water arrived. He couldn't handle the criticism from the politicians and the papers at the time. The pipeline's been pushing water out here for over a hundred years, and in places still using some of the original pipes. O'Connor was one of the state's heroes with his forward thinking. Behind him, heaps of towns have sprung up, all using the same water. Today the old steam pumps are gone, replaced with the newer, smaller pumps and more towns and more people relying on the water supply. Now there are 20 smaller pumps to keep the water running to many other towns away from the main line. If you want to do this trip you could do it in a couple of days but if you take your time there's heaps of amazing stuff that you can look at while you're going along. In the meantime, happy travels. G'day folks, how are you going? Thanks for watching my videos. Uh, hit the like button if you like the video and uh, also consider subscribing to the channel. Hit the little bell button and that will send you an email to let you know when I've uploaded a new video. That's all free, there's nothing, no charge there for that. Uh, also if you want to contribute something to the production of these videos there's a Patreon link down below as well. See you later. Nothing like this had ever been done before over such a great distance. There were major issues. <laughs> Bloody nature. <laughs> Once they started groundworks. I don't know what's buzzing around me, but bugger off. Once they started groundworks on the granite base, it was soon discovered that there was an ev evacuation point. Oh no, we have to dig further so that we can still evacuate. The early pump stations all ran on steam, so they needed a good supply of firewood. So they could be under As it removed the need for rivets and holes to poke into the pipe, which would have the effect of slowing the pipes down. O'Connor never saw the water come out here. 
He committed suicide about six months before the water arrived. Six months before the six months before the six months before the water arrived. He couldn't handle the criticisms from the politicians and the pay 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 papers. He committed suicide about six months before the water and I started too early because it's too slow. Criticisms from the politicians. Water come out here. He commuted. If you wanted to do this trip, you could do it in a couple it's of. Cut off. Oh. Anyway, in the meantime, I've grew that up because I'm doing this.